for joining us today um, at Find My Pass at Home. I'm, I'm in my home. So, and I live in Northern Ireland and I am, I've been with Find My Pass since about 2014. My name is Mary McKee. I should have said that to start. Um, some of you have may have joined me already for a couple of other presentations. Um, and I did an earlier presentation about a month and a half ago on newspapers. So I'll be referencing that a little bit today. And today's presentation is doing a deeper dive into newspapers. Newspapers are one of my favorite topics to talk about. There's no end to the conversation of what you can find in, in our newspapers. And thank you again for everybody joining. I can see more people coming through. Uh, so hello uh, and, and uh, pleased to see everybody here. So I think we've got a we've got a good amount of people here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start jumping into today's presentation. So um, looking at newspapers beyond the obituaries. So discover more from your newspaper search. So during the presentation today, I want to actually, I'm going to pull out a bit more from what you guys have told us. We love to hear your feedback at Find My Pass, and we love to hear about your discoveries. What is it about our records or our newspapers that you're connecting to? And I have a great um, comment here from one of our, our customers who mentioned that they think people in general would be surprised about how often their ancestors appear in the newspapers. I have found births, marriages, and death columns particularly useful in local papers where my ancestors lived. Obituaries provide insights into the characters of long dead relatives, thus bringing them to life once more. For example, little details emerge such as finding out that my great uncle Robert killed in World War I was known as Bob, uh, by his police colleagues in Borough and Furnace. They all paint a picture. And this person is 100% right. It's all of these little details that really paint a picture about your ancestor's life. Now, in this comment here, you can see, you know, talked about the births, the marriages, and the deaths. So those life events, and those are key to building your family tree. But what I want to get into today is going slightly beyond those life events. On Find My Past, we have over 42 million new pages of British and Irish historic newspapers, ranging from 1699 to 2009. Every single week, we are releasing new pages of newspapers on our sites. Um, so that is going on to Find My Past, but also the British Newspaper Archive. And um, the biggest part of us bringing these newspapers to you is our partnership with the British Library. We were actually on site with the British Library scanning their newspaper collection. And that has given us a never ending resource of material to continuously scan. So I know everybody out there has a newspaper title in mind or a specific year in mind that they, they want on our site and we're, we're gonna get there. It just does take time uh, to scan millions and millions of newspapers pages. But I think we're doing really well at a 42 million at the moment. So Janine has just asked, how far back do you have newspapers? So the earliest one we have is from 1699, and that is the Edinburgh Gazette that we have on Find My Past. Newspapers are an incredible re resource for those birth, marriage, and death announcements that we, we've already started to talk about. But they also have local and national news that go far beyond those family announcements. To give you an idea of the range of newspapers that you can find. We have um, so we have Scottish, Irish, Welsh, and English newspapers. So there's some examples there. We have the um, Aberdeen People's Journal, the Belfast Newsletter, a Welsh title that is in completely in Welsh, so I'm not gonna try to pronounce it. And uh, maybe later on, Ellie can help me with that. And we have the Manchester Evening News for, for an example of one of our English titles. We also have specialty titles too. So like the Mother's Companion, which is like a women's interest newspaper. On the March is a military title and the Police Gazette, pretty self-explanatory. And we have a range of sporting titles too. So I think it's time to just, let's just jump into the topic here. 
One of the first ways that you might find your ancestor in the newspapers is through information about business, local businesses, and bankruptcy as well. So I love newspaper advertisements. This is one of my favorite things to look at when I go into the newspaper. And originally, you know, the, the big newspaper headlines that we see today, uh, that didn't really exist until the 20th century. Earlier, all the front page was just advertisements. So if you're looking at a local newspaper from where your ancestor's from and your, your ancestor had a some kind of a business or they they were some kind of a craftsman or, you know, a tradesman, it's very likely that they might have put in an ad. Now, this example is quite a big advertisement. Sometimes they'd be quite small, um, just a few lines in kind of the, the advertisement columns. And you can see in this advertisement here um, about pork curing and, and, and they specialize in bacon and hams. But the reason why I pulled this example out is I love Thomas Henry, how big and bold that name is. And it's a great way for you to find your ancestor. Another example here is the Ballin, Ballinode Scotch Corn and Sawmills. And now this isn't an advertisement, it's just really an update about the local mill. The, the mill is going through some improvements. It was being remodeled under the supervision of Mr. John McCall of Dramar. Interesting fact, Dramar is only about 10 miles down the road from where I am right now. And the scutch mills was used to work flax. So flax is how we um, produced linen. And it gives you a little bit more information just about the fact that the mill, they've upgraded their corn mills and the corn grinder. And then it has um, Wilson Jameson, the name at the bottom, I presume is the, is the mill owner. So it's interesting to just know if, if your ancestor maybe came from that area and you know that they worked in the mill, this is an indication of the day-to-day -day life. You know, life is kind of what happens in the in-between. It's that daily minutia. It's, it's those little details that add a lot more color to your family tree. And I'm, I'm seeing some questions and comments coming through. So Diane has a question of, does um, Pharma Past have the same range of newspapers as the British newspaper archive? Or, and that is, yes, 100%. All the newspapers that you find on the British Newspaper Archive are also available on Find My Pass in the British and Irish newspaper section of our newspaper search. So thank you for, and, and please keep sending in your questions. Okay, so continuing on with the um, topic or the idea of, of business and bankruptcy. We have a, a notice here on the left-hand side, an important nuisance information. So this was a, a gentleman, James Gretton, who owned a horn and hair factory, uh, was cited for a nuisance. And it wasn't because of a noise violation. It wasn't about auditory um, nuisance. It was actually a, a nuisance to the public health. And what the... Um, what the, the grievance was was basically that um, Gretton owned a horn and hair factory and the the prosecution was saying that the odors from the premises was very offensive and causing sickness and fever in the local area. Even a local, uh, even a medical analyst came in and gave testimony to say that the process of the hair drying um, found that it was it was creating fumes, there was decomposition of animal matter, and that was injurious to health and creating, you know, producing fever in the local area. But a counter argument to this is in Gretton's defense, a petition was signed from 100 neighbors that stated that the business was of no such nuisance. Nobody in the area was suffering from fevers, employees were called in as well to say that they, um, uh, that they they support the business that um, they they never suffered from fever even the local primary doctor reported that the family hadn't suffered from fever so ultimately the case was adjourned um, this article was featured in who do you think you are um, a couple of years ago with uh, it was the episode with Emma Willis in it and it was her ancestor uh, it's James Gretton and it just shows you that the amount of detail that you can find in a newspaper article. I mean, it's not just that, oh, you know, you found a record that said there was a, 
you know, a, a nuisance, nuisance citation. This goes into such great detail about how the local neighbors, you know, rallied around and signed a petition and that there was difference of opi medical opinions. You know, there's a lot more color to this story than just one violation. Another example I have here is from the Court of Chancery, and this comes from the Morning Chronicle in 1824. Um, and it is about looking for repayment for investment in a piano business. And it, Mr. Mott, who owned the piano business, um, had actually created a, a particular type of piano. And he had an investor who was now trying to get his money back because even though the piano was very good, it wasn't creating a profit. So you can see in the details of that how much money were exchanged and how much profit was and was not made. Um, this was in 1824. And then by 1840, we find the same family again listed in bankruptcy. So just a demonstration of how you can follow the, um, the business along too. You know, you might see an advertisement, you might find a notice about, you know, some, some public forum going on related to the business. And then hopefully not for your, all your ancestors, but sometimes they will end up on the bankruptcy registry as well. Okay. So while we're talking about bankruptcies and insolvencies, it has brought to mind another newspaper that we have, which is the London Gazette. Well, it's not quite a newspaper. Um, and the London Gazette doesn't actually sit in our British and Irish newspaper. So this is um, an example of something that you won't find in the British newspaper archive. It is only on Find My Past. We have completely indexed the entire Gazette. So it's not the same kind of newspaper search that you're used to. The London Gazette goes from 1665 to 2018, and it covers items like uh, corporate and personal insolvency, uh, personal legal notices related to deceased estates. There is company notices and profiles, incorporation of companies, all vivid, like, to me, this sounds like really interesting stuff, incorporation of companies, um, and state notices about, um, such as like bills receiving royal assent. But they are, um, they are an incredible historical document to, to go through. And again, if, you're, if your ancestor owned a business, you definitely have to take a look at the Gazette. Um, Ellie, who is helping with, with comments today, it will we'll put a, a link in the, in the chat to, to direct you to the Gazette. Now, that's just the London Gazette. We do also have the Belfast Gazette, Dublin Gazette, and Edinburgh Gazette as well. So um, the range for those, the year range for those uh, slightly differ, but to find all of them, if you go to the search navigation bar, select all record sets, and then simply put in the word Gazette, you'll see them all listed. So you can see those, the, the top four items that we were just talking about, London and Scotland and Ireland. Um, a few other items will come up as well, because this search is searching every record set we hold. So you'll find the Police Gazette and also some other newspapers that we have specifically within the Find My Past newspapers because they have been um, indexed or transcribed by the name. So that's why they're slightly different again from the newspaper search. And uh, a couple of examples there, you have the Philadelphia Roman Catholic Diocese newspapers as well as the Irish Death Notices in American newspapers. It's a really interesting collection, um, which I don't know if we have time to go into today, but uh, definitely check it out. So crime, uh, that is definitely the, the next topic here, but I just wanna look at some of the questions and comments here. A uh, question from Keith, can you show please how to find a newspaper reporting of an event as um, distinct from a search for a person? Okay, uh, one example I would, I, and, and Keith also adds here, for example, the casualty list after um, Jutland. So to search, um, if you're searching for an event specifically, I would use the, the keyword search instead of the name search. Um, and also you can use the quotations. So um, I, this example here that Keith mentioned was just Jutland. So I would just search Jutland and really narrow your focus, your uh, search through the search filters. So that would be like um, 
using the year range and then even maybe location as well to if you want to look for that local paper. Now always, and I, I probably say this in every uh, presentation that I do, um, my biggest rule with newspapers is don't always narrow your focus to just your local paper. You know, if you are looking for information about something that ho happened locally, you'll be surprised how often it is actually reported in maybe the, the county newspaper or the next county over, how wide the, the newspapers got. I mean, newspapers, particularly in the 19th century, that is a lot of space that they had to fill and they did not have that many reporters. So they were literally stealing, you know, <laughs> bits of stories from other newspapers across uh, the area. And there was no kind of plagiarism at, at, at play. They just, you know, where everybody kind of reported similar stories, even if it was, you know, a, a car accident in Scotland could be actually reported in Wales. It's surprising how far it goes. So please uh, don't just go to your local newspaper and only search in there. Search the entire collection and then narrow down. Always start broad and then narrow your focus. So back over to crime, one of our favorite topics. Uh, we do know that our, our uh, users love searching for records around crime, um, particularly murder. Um, it seems like everybody has a fixation on murder, but I, I'm not going to go really deep into that. I don't think we need to know why. But the uh, one thing I have to always say when we're talking about crime records, if you are researching your family tree and you come across a, a criminal case, particularly we have on Find My Past, we have the um, England and Wales Crime Court and Punishment record set, which I'm sure Ellie is going to find uh, the link for and add it into the chat for us. And it's the records that was created in partnership with the National Archive. So it's the, a lot of the home office records, the central criminal court records, a fantastic record set for you to dig into. And if you find your ancestor in those records or you find, you know, somebody you're looking for within those records, always try to check the newspapers next. That's where you get the complete story from and the full picture. So here's an example here. We have James Rowe um, in this record at the very top. James Rowe is a clergyman and he is listed here in the um, trial calendars of prisoners. Uh, it mentions his crime as forging an order for the payment of 6,000 pounds. And then in the next record that we find about him, we can see that he's been sentenced to 10 years of penal service. Now that's the limit of the criminal records. It, it's given us, we do know what he was charged with, but we don't know the whole story. We don't know what his intent was, why he forged 6,000 pounds, how did this all come about? And that's why the newspapers is the next place to look. As soon as you get this information, start looking for the newspapers, search for the name, um, and then search the narrow by the date. Again, don't just go to the to the local newspaper because this was a central criminal court case. It would have been reported in multiple newspapers. So this report gives us a lot more information. We find out that Reverend James Rowe, um, again, he was sentenced to 10 years for the extraordinary forgery. And then it tells us the story behind it. He was dissatisfied with the will that his uncle, Mr. Edward Rowe, created. And he only bequeathed them 500 pounds. So he applied, um, Reverend Rowe uh, applied to the Court of Chancery to set aside the will. Uh, he failed in that attempt. So then afterwards, he forged a letter and a check for 6,000 pounds to say that it was previously sent from his uncle before his death. He took this to the court again. And then in the proceedings of the court, it was found that this was a, a, a fraudulent um, check. So then that is where he then gets charged. So there's a whole story before James Rowe even gets charged. And that's how we get the, we need to check the newspapers for this. Uh, there's a, a question has come in and asked if a 1917 criminal story was covered extensively for months in every um, Australian newspaper, would they like they've been picked up in the British newspapers? And I would say if it's a big enough case, yes, we do. The, the British newspapers does carry a lot of um, international news. It's it's amazing how much you can find about what's going on in the States and New York and Boston just through the, the British newspapers. So I would I would have a look, uh, see if that case has been picked up. But like I said, if it is a, a pretty big national case, 
it is possible that it would, would be picked up. So thank you again. Please keep sending your, your questions through. Um, and thanks everybody staying on and, and watching. So picking up back to crime. Yeah, so um, going back into this idea is that you can find such rich detail in these records about what, what's going on. Um, and in this case, so on the left-hand side, we can see that it is labeled a pitiful case. And it tells a story, <clears throat> excuse me, it tells a story about a 13 year old boy who was charged with stealing a clasp knife and two money boxes and eight shillings. And again, if you found this, this young boy in the criminal records, it probably would have just mentioned that there was theft, might not have detailed exactly what he stole, but then it gives you a little bit more insight into his personal life that it, it mentions that the lad had no mother. Um, the father didn't pay much attention to his children. So you can see that the kid, you know, the, the child's really struggling. Um, it's quite, a, you know, a pitiful situation, uh, which is what led to the, to the title of the article. In this other example, um, this, uh, it's a, a raid of a ball in 1880. It's called the Man. Well, now looking back, we, we call it the Manchester Drag Ball Raid. Uh, one of the original, uh, one of the earliest examples of a, a police raid on a on a drag ball, and the the whole story is in such rich detail in the newspaper. It was covered by the Illustrated Police News, which is why we have this incredible image alongside with it. The Illustrated Police News, anything that could be spun into a salacious story was picked up by them and often you could have uh, an, an illustration of alongside it. And if you ever want to kind of just go down a rabbit hole, please just look through pages and pages of the Illustrated Police News. There's some fantastic images in there too. Um, it's definitely, it's a, one of the favorite of the of Fire Pass staff. So in this particular situation, um, there was a, a ball was arranged and it was booked into a hall um, under the name of the Palm Brokers Association. But it came to light that the Palm Brokers Association did not, in fact, hire the hall, um, had no idea of what the ball could be. So a, a stakeout was planned to watch what was going to unfold. And it, the newspaper article, it goes on for two full articles to tell you every detail about this, that the guests start to arrive at 9 p.m., a considerable number of them. Um, were men in female attire. Um, it goes into detail about their elaborate costume, low body dresses. They were wearing tawdry uh, bracelets and, and jewelry. It even goes in to let you know that the, the dancing commenced by 10 p.m. There was an orchestra playing and the dances were those familiar with low class music halls. And a lot of this detail we have because uh, as the article tells you is the detective um, on the case was actually positioned opposite uh, the building on the roof, watching everything going on. There was two other plainclothes uh, police officers on an adjacent roof who were concealing themselves behind the chimney stack. I mean, all of this is adding up for an amazing episode uh, of TV, I think, here with, with all the details. And then the article also lists then later on the names of everybody um, that were arrested. So the police did charge into the ball um, and arrested the, the men there. Um, they arrested them under uh, various crimes, but uh, mainly because, uh, because homosexuality was illegal. Um, that is, was kind of their main offense. So the names were all listed alongside their residence and their occupation, which to the men involved were, would be extremely detrimental. And on this note, just when you look at a case where there's multiple people involved, I highly recommend taking down the names of everybody else involved too. Get to know what happened to them and then find out more about their story. It's often that the victims or the accusers or, or people involved in these cases do know each other and will come into each other's lives at different times. So moving on, we have another crime that uh, your ancestor might appear in the newspaper for is a breach of promise. And a breach of promise was a very serious offense. It meant that it compromised a woman's reputation and her potential to go on to a, a second chance at a marriage. 
And essentially, it was because in the, the eyes of the court, a promise of engagement to marry was legally binding. So if um, uh, more often than not, it would have been the male and the opposite sex couple who uh, changed his mind. Um, and then he could be brought to court for a breach of contract, essentially a breach of promise. So in this example, we have here is a young woman named Lizzie. And it goes into a long article, goes into great detail about the relationship between Lizzie and a stable boy who managed, uh, well, actually, sorry, he was a jockey um, who trained horses at the inn that her father owned. The article goes into like really good detail about his, their relationship. It showed, it actually reprinted some of the letters that they sent to each other about how they love each other and um, that they're gonna build a house together and uh, details about gifts that the woman received. She received an engagement ring, a dress, a writing case, two brooches. And all of this was to build the case to say, you know, that he bre breached uh, his promise because then you find out that there was rumors that he was engaged to another woman. And his defense was that, you know, the mutually um, ended the engagement and the, uh, plaintiff uh so lizzie was saying no that that's not true at all um and within a month of this apparent end of engagement he was married to another woman at the end of the case the the jury does find for the defense for the plaintiff um and they have to uh the the young man in question has to pay damages of 50 shillings for his breach of promise but it's incredible. I just love the fact that they like reproduced the letters that they sent to each other could detail all of the, the ins and outs of this personal relationship in this newspaper article. And you can see that breach of promise cases actually went up into the 50s. So we have another example here from the Lancaster uh, Evening Post from 1954 of a woman who was actually age 69, sued a man who was 74 for a breach of promise. And while we're talking about uh, these kind of cases, I also want to add in just a little search tip. If you're looking at cases that often that involve a woman, you'll see that usually uh, a woman is listed in the article or in a, in a case as her title, uh, followed by her surname. So when you're searching for your female ancestors, start with surname only because it's not very likely that you'll have her full first name and her full surname in the newspaper. Generally title and surname. So coming back to what you guys tell us and please keep sending in more information about what you guys uh, find in the newspapers, the discoveries, the connections you make. And in this example, uh, one of our customers told us that their two times great grandfather was a police officer uh, um, and was clever enough to capture a forger from Melton Mowbray and, and Lancashire, sorry, my accent is going to butcher these names of places in 18, this happened in 1867. And the our customer was saying, you know, this excites them immensely. It's really exciting to see what your your ancestor can do um, and understand more about their career and their, their occupation. But this is a great point to look at the flip side of the crime. We've been looking at people that were brought to uh, court, but what about the people that brought the criminals in. So here's an example from, we have the Royal Irish, um, Royal Irish Constabulary Pension Papers. And in these papers, um, they are from 1826 to 1925. So these are pensions. So these are after the person has died or retired. Um, and it will give you a little bit of information about what their job title was, or maybe where they were stationed. But then if we go into the newspapers, you can find out so much more about their career. So this example here is about Edward Hill. And the articles tell us that Edward Hill was transferred from Portadown to Louth. And the local area gave him a gift of a silver tea set. And they made a couple of announcements. These are two distinct um, announcements in newspapers about about his transfer um, and about his reputation in the area that he he has been uh, distinguished in public and in private life uh, for straightforward manly and incorruptible discharges of his duty and 
It also mentions the ever active and zealous in discharge of his duties and his actions um, while guided by firmness and rules by the strictest impartiality. So it's an amazing review of your ancestor's career to find something like that. And then if you go even closer, particularly for a police officer, they could be named in other articles. So we can find here even more details about Edward's work, that he, he was part of a search team and he found a pike concealed in a wall. He arrested a Mr. James Baxter for high treason. He eventually then was promoted to County Inspector of Wicklow. And that's where we see in his RIC pension records that he is listed as the County Inspector for, for Wicklow. So let's let's move on and talk more about occupations. Uh, the, the newspapers that we have on site have a lot of uh, specialty newspapers. So you can take a closer look at your ancestors' occupation, whether they worked as a docker or maybe in a cotton factory. Recently, we just had a comment on the British Newspaper Archives Twitter, and I loved it. It said, you know, that this person is obsessed with the uh, Cotton Factory Times that we released a, a, a few weeks ago, from or a few months ago, I think, from 1885 to 1937. And the, the user here says, you know, it's got everything. Weaver poets, uh, mutual improvement classes, trade unionist poets, ILP reps, Lancashire dialect, political songs, a whole smorgasbord of working class, liter literary culture, um, if you will. And it's incredible what you can find in the newspaper. I mean, I yeah, I have to definitely have a look closer and, and find more about these weaver poets. So we have the Cotton Factory Times, and that's just one example of one of these specialty titles that you can find. We have the Docs Gazette. Um, we only have one uh, year of this from, from 1920, but you can see from the contents, uh, it gives you a lot of information about what it, what it was like to be a doctor. So I think this is a really important part of where you build the context of your ancestor's life. Yet not all the time will you find your ancestor's specific name in a newspaper um, in a legal case or in a, a, a description about, you know, being a doctor. But if you read the, you know, the, the newspapers about the occupation around that time period, it gives you really a, a, a better sense of what it was like for your ancestor in that role. So in this um, title here, uh, we have a, there's an article um, about law cases. So it's in every issue of the doctor's Gazette. And this particular law case tells us that um, there was a gentleman, Charles Jones, uh, he had dropped his hammer into the hold of the ship. So he went back to back into the ship, went down to the hold, retrieved his ladder and on his way back up uh, his hammer on his way back up the ladder, he was struck um, on the head by one of the loads swinging about and was badly injured. He spent a week in work or week in the hospital and he wasn't able to work. So the opposite side, the defendant pled um, that the plaintiff, uh, Mr. Jones, had no business to even be in the hold. It was his own fault for dropping the hammer. He shouldn't have been there. And at the end of the day, the, the judge actually found no neglig like negligence because it was on Mr. Jones to actually notify the team that were unloading the ship that he had to go back in and was going um, down to the hold. But it gives you an idea. Uh, about the dangers uh, of, of work, how you know easily an accident could happen there. Other titles we have here, we have the, the Brewing uh, brewing Trade Gazette. Uh, I was going through this yesterday. I had no idea how many different thermometers you could have for, for a brewer, but there's an advertisement for the different types of thermometers. We also have the National Teacher and Irish Educational Journal. I'm not saying that drinking and teaching go together, I'm just saying, though, if you've ever taught in a primary education, education, um, then yeah, I think sometimes you deserve uh, a nice brew of of a, a stout or something like that. And I was digging into the um, the National Teacher and Education Irish Education Journal, um, and it was one of the things that I absolutely loved were these examinations. So the um, the journal had examples of examinations for um, for composition, penmanship, grammar. Um, you can see their history, 
you know, the, that the, the students were going to ask to give an account of the operations of British troops in North America in 1814. And then that result, that would be eight marks. Um, and then also they had to describe the origin and extent of the power of Carthage. And I think it's just incredible, even though I don't have an ancestor that was a teacher, um, just to know, you know, to read these things that my Irish ancestors in the 1890s, these could have been some of the exams that they were that they were sitting and what they were learning in school. So this particular newspaper came out weekly. Um, it also includes some information about relating to the occupation about taxation, committee reports. Um, there is even a, a great article about teaching in a workhouse. So that's another perspective on what life would be like in a workhouse. And then another uh, specialty newspaper, The Showman and the Stage. I mean, that's pretty straightforward to say. This is the arts, this is the entertainment. If your your ancestor hit the, the floorboards of the music halls, it is likely that their, their name is going to appear in here. Now, in all of this, I've showed special newspapers, but please, again, don't limit yourself. Always search broad and then narrow down from there. So if you are particularly interested in just the arts, then yes, go straight to the stage and, and read through that. But if you're looking for a particular name, search all the newspapers because of course, events or art events or, or shows would have been advertised or reviewed in all of the newspapers, uh, local and national. And the same with any of these other items we talked about, working you know, in the cotton factory or um, teaching teachers unions or committees, those would also be reported in other kind of local newspapers. And another comment that we had from our customers, which I absolutely loved here, and I'm just going to make this a bit bigger for you so you can see it. Uh, a, one of our um, customers commented that they, uh, that they were looking at their actual, the house history. So they found the names of everybody that lived in their house um, and found them in the, in the census records, but then they used the newspapers. And in this example, use the newspapers such as the West Cumberland Times and Mary Port Advertiser to track down fascinating stories. Uh, these are stories which helped me to gain a better understanding of those who toiled in the mines here. So I've left out from the beginning that the, um, the, house was actually, uh, they knew it was built as a miner's cottage and they knew that um, miners lived there because of the census returns. So they used the newspapers to get a better understanding of what it was like to um, be a miner at that time. And, you know, for these, these people who toiled in the mines here long ago and then returned home to our little abode. And I just thought that was just so sweet to understand that those people that came home to, to when your house was their home and what it was like. So there's a, a question coming through here. I've got a question from Heather. If I put my surname, which is Rose, and I get a results for flowers, of course, uh, how do I refine this? And you can actually use the plus or minus to uh, remove some some words or add them. So you could minus, but put in the minus and then flowers. And that should work to remove articles that mention the word flowers alongside rose. And so moving on to our next topic, committees and community activism. In the local areas, uh, community groups and committees were the heart of a community. They, you know, they, they were involved in everything um, from celebrations to the local sewage systems, all of these items, uh, you'll find that people were part of local committees, even for different movements like the suffrage movement and the temperance movement as well. And then we also have a lot of charities and then community activism as well. I mean, like I said, our newspapers do go up to 2009. So you can find very modern um, activism in our newspapers and follow these groups and, and what they did. So in some examples like this, it's fantastic that you can find a photograph alongside a list of committee members. It's an amazing uh, achievement to find a photograph of your ancestor in the newspaper. 
And here's a couple of examples of some committees. So this comes from 1911. And this was ahead of the coronation of King George. And we have, um, from just the one newspaper, we have articles about different areas. So Pensnet and Pedford. And it tells about the local committees and what they are planning for, for the coronation. So Pedmore raised 70 pounds for the celebrations. They were gonna have a procession, sports, tea for children and adults, and a display of fireworks, and then a bonfire. And Pensnet, they were also gonna have appropriate festivities. However, they raised 100 pounds, uh, far more than Pedmore. And at night, they were gonna have sports and bonfire. There was also gonna be a children's procession. And I'd like to take a, a just a, another kind of closer look at these committees because you can see here that in the newspaper it, it breaks down the different types of committees. So you had a firework committee, the bonfire, the sports, the ladies committee, and then it gives the names of everybody that participated in that. And it's really be wonderful to find, you know, my ancestor contributed to this special day for their for their local community. Then we have other types of associations like the Infirmary Ladies Association. Um, and in this article, it details their annual meeting. So within the, the report, you can find details about who's the president, the vice president, who spoke at the meeting. Um, again, I, just to point out the, the naming convention, um, and it's the same, you know, for, for men and women, often it'll be a title and a surname or a title and a first initial and a surname. So often you won't find that first name. And then for for some women, uh, you will find that they are referred to by their husband's name. So Mrs. Harry Case for this other example in the Colchester Imbecile Asylum. And it's their their annual meeting as well as being detailed. Uh, for the Colchester um, Association, I thought it was really interesting that they also detailed exactly how much each person had collected. Um, I think it's kind of, it's a bit of like a, a popularity competition to say like, how much did you contribute to the association? But uh, yeah, so it, again, be really interesting to, to find your ancestor to see uh, how much they were able to raise for, for the local association. I've come across lists like this before also for weddings, which is really interesting where they actually detail the um, wedding gift that every single guest brought. So I think you would you would really think about what you're gonna give for a, a wedding gift if you knew it was gonna be in the local newspaper. And another thing I want to point out, to look out for is for these local committees is the elections and nominations. This is where you get a lot of really name rich uh, articles. You have this one coming in, this one's being voted out. So in this article here, we have Mr. John Robinson was unanimously re-elected as the chairman and he's part of the library committee. But don't stop your search there. So we know here that in 1899, he becomes the chairman of the library committee. So follow what happens to the library committee. What kind of decisions were being made? What were, was being looked after? So we can find more information here about the library committee. So in an article here from the from 1900, we have that the committee expressed their sorrow for the death of their ex provost, as well as details about a lot of history books that were donated. Well, a lot of different books, sorry, that were donated to the to the local library. So, what was it that your ancestors' library held? What what kind of books were the books of the day? And we have the history of the newspaper press. Imagine that, such a great interest in newspapers. It's it's never ending. Then we have the story, uh, uh, another book by about Randolph Spencer Churchill. We have another book listed of Thackeray's English humorists of the 18th century. And then in another article, we can see um, that the library committed committee has agreed to have the reading room supplied with newspapers for another quarter. And then the library was also given a collection of fossils, uh, which were donated along with preserved specimens of the carpet snake and the carny lizard. So a lot of different things you could check out um, and have a look at in, in the local library. And another one of our amazing community members mentioned that looking at the newspapers enabled this uh, enabled me to find in 
fill in, sorry, fill in many of the gaps I had in my study by helping me identify residents in the years between the published 10 years census records. Their social, family, and community activity is recorded in the local newspapers. And I think this is really important as well to remember that you're when you're building your family tree, you're looking, you know, you have the life events, you have your birth and your marriage, your death, um, and you know, maybe some other kind of records in between. You have your census records. But again, what is happening between all of that? What is their life like? What's the local area like? And this is where you go into the into the newspapers. And now moving on to another topic, military. I'm just looking at the time here. Um, so I will move through this kind of quickly. Um, but talking about military, of course, if you're um, if your ancestor won an award or was you know commemorated in some way, they could land in the newspaper. And we have a number of specialty newspaper titles here. So Here's an example of, of four of them, the Outer Shot uh, Military Gazette, we have the Military Register, the Volunteer Service Gazette, the War Office Times, um, all with different kind of year ranges, but we have a really great collection of newspapers that completely covers the First World War. So if that's your interest area, we have you covered with military newspapers. And then we've got even more. We have the War Office Weekly Casualty List, which is really important. I know it's only 1917 and 1919, but it's really important if you're looking for a First World War um, soldier. And in these lists, it, it does include the names of the missing and the wounded. And we'll also note if, uh, if somebody is a casualty of war, they may have previously been wounded or presumed missing at a, some point. Another newspaper I mentioned earlier is On the March, which was the official journal of the Royal Army Temperance Association. So this is a general journal. It gives advice, um, general news, special interest pieces, um, such as this, this one here from 1920 um, in February has a whole article about the nervous system. And then I want to give special attention to a newspaper called Good Morning, which is a fantastic newspaper. It was a daily paper published for the submarine branch and it was published during the second world war and it was a way to bring a, a piece of home to the men uh, that spent weeks away submerged in the oceans the paper was delivered in bundles at the port of about 30 um, in a bundle and then the papers instead of being dated they were actually just numbered and they were given out every day so they featured really light kind of news humorous stories of course you had your pinup girls in there and comics like popeye and then the most incredible part of these newspapers is that they actually published personal stories for the seamen about their families back home. So you have photographs of the the families that they, they sent into the newspaper and then they, you know, on board the submarines, you could open up the newspaper and find, you know, a, a picture of your mother or your fiance. It's an incredible newspaper to check out. And if you're interested in military news, look at the um, illustrated titles. So we have the, the illustrated war news and the war. And the reason why I, I'm mentioning these is, again, going back to that idea, if you don't find your ancestor's name, understand a lot more about your ancestor's life. Um, if they were in a military battle, what was that battle look like? So for example, here we have Gallipoli. So this first image, is amazing image of the French um, landing with their artillery it has you know warships and transport and this was drawn by a French artist um, and then we have a second picture here of ambulance work in Gallipoli oh sorry no skipped on this not the ambulance work no this is a, a picture of um, it's actually called a uh, British landing parties and it's a picture of the British surrendering at Gallipoli. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. That did not happen, and you're totally right. This was a reproduction uh, that they put in the Illustrated News and of what the German um, propaganda press was publishing. So the German were creating completely different illustrations of what was happening on the battlefield. So it, this was a reproduction of one of those illustrations. And the final image here is the is actually a real illustration from Gallipoli of the ambulance work. So you have the stretcher bearers with a, a wounded man. And I know I know myself, uh, 
we have our Find My Past photo collection, um, and there's a lot of images there from the Second World War, and Ellie's gonna add a, a link to the photo collection in the chat here for, for you to have a look at. But, you know, I my grandfather was in the D-Day in, in, in Normandy, and I don't have a lot of information about that, but to look at photographs of it is incredible to just understand what it looked like, maybe what it felt like to be in those moments. If your ancestor was a prisoner of war, we have our Find My Past, the, the prisoner of war records are extensive going back from the Napoleonic War through to the Second World War. Um, we have millions of records from the Second World War Far East prisoners. And the newspapers, again, can add more detail about what it was like to be a prisoner at that time. And oftentimes the details never surfaced until after the liberation of the camp. So don't look in the newspapers for just that year that your ancestor you know, was captured. Look years beyond that after, after the camps were liberated and more details are coming out about that, about that experience. And then regiments. So if you know that your ancestor was in a particular regiment, so you found them in the in Find My Past records for the Queen's Royal West uh, Surrey Regiment, we have records for those from 1901 to 1918. Then you can look at the newspapers to understand what was a bit more about what that regiment participated in. So we have here um, an example of the Queen's Royal West uh, Surrey Regiment, we have a Major Pell um, was selected for attendance at the Staff College. We have more information to say another member of this regiment uh, resigned from his commission. And then we even find out that the regimental band played um, at this particular event. And then even more incredible is finding images of it. Um, so 1925, we have this great portrait illustration of, of the regiment. And then from 1914, you have this amazing photograph of uh, the Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment. And then outside of, you know, we, we've ta I've talked today about, you know, business and occupations and military for these are all the different reasons your ancestor will end up in the newspaper. So please keep searching at those in between years, find the, the information in between the uh, census records. And another just other reasons why you, your ancestor could end up in the newspaper. In the top left corner there, we have uh, Mr. Teague was um, awarded into the Inventors Institute. Did your ancestor invent something? As mine, maybe it was small, but they could have invented something and ended up in the newspaper. We have um, on the right-hand side there, there's a whole newspaper, the, the Sun in 1839, a whole page is just full of these names of people who applied for a game duty license, meaning that they were a hunter and they, they had to apply for a, le a game duty. And then you have estate um, sales after a person's deceased, maybe their estate went, went on sale. And that also leads me on to the idea of house history, which is uh, newspapers are an amazing resource for house history. Uh, we don't have a, another hour to go through house history today, but we've already given um, some great presentations. There's been some amazing work uh, around house history. So I definitely recommend going over to our YouTube channel and, and checking out some of those resources if you want to look into house history. So just a, a few a few tips. Oh, I want to actually look at the questions really quick here. Um, somebody made a comment saying, many businesses, including my parents, uh, was compulsory purchased back in the 70s. Could I find something on this? That's really interesting. Um, I. We do have newspapers up until 2009, so definitely recommend diving into there. I would wonder about local, you know, about the local business papers, um, maybe about insolvency. I'm not sure exactly how you mean that they were purchased, but I would say that the local record office would be your best bet to find more information. Information about businesses in the 70s, we wouldn't have so much on Find My Past, but your local record office would hold those kind of deeds or, or um, evidence of sale. 
So just a, a kind of a quick recap about what we talked about today and some, some tips I want to give you is about linking your record discoveries back to the newspapers. Try to find more about that story and linking to two together. Explore the local area through the newspapers. Get to know more about your ancestors' occupation, whether that's through one of those specialty newspaper titles or you could find out more through just the general local newspaper. And always remember, start your search really broad and then narrow it down. So for example, look up just the name of the regiment, uh, look up just a surname, and then start to narrow down by, by years and, and locality from there. And just to kind of finish off actually today's presentation, I found that one of our community members sent this in, and it was actually um, towards it was last year uh, when, when we kind of entered the first lockdown, but I think it's a really uh, amazing quote. And it, they said that uh, a lot of, because of us digitizing the newspapers, we're preserving the history. And their response to this was, you know, a lot of local stories are on the brink of being lost and the connection people have with their area with it. Knowing the history of where you live is important in creating a sense of community and belonging. It is important for mental well-being. During the first lockdown, I came across a word, topophilia, hopefully I'm saying that right, and it means the love of or emotional connections with place or physical environments. And I think that it's something a lot of us have rediscovered in the past year, connecting with our green spaces, nature, and local history. And I think that was an amazing quote to really understand what it is that we are hoping that you connect with, the power of the newspapers that can help you really reconnect with that local history and your local area. So I think we are at the kind of the top of the hour here. So uh, I'm not gonna keep you on here for too much longer. I did just wanna say that there's more help and advice out there. Um, if you go to the help and more section on the site, there's the help hub. You can search newspapers and I'll give you all of the articles about newspapers like pro tips and how to find criminal ancestors. Over at the British Newspaper Archive, we have a huge blog there. Check it out. It also has hints and tips. Uh, the YouTube channel I've already mentioned about, we have videos there of house history, but all of these um, Find My Pass at Home videos are collected at there too. So if you've missed a recording, please check it out and the Find My Past Forum on Facebook is an amazing place. We have an incredible community there and people are always happy to help. They really want to get uh, help you with your research, get to know more about what you're looking for. And so at that, I just want to say thank you for, for everybody for joining. I thank you for your questions and your comments. And as well, um, thank you, Ellie, who is, is joining in the background there and has helped uh, with today's presentation. So cheerio, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.